technical experiences in Spain, uh, obviously with Spain being one of the hardest hit countries by COVID-19 to date. Um, so we'll take the, the, the talks first, and then uh, thereafter we're hoping that we'll have around 20 minutes for a panel discussion. Uh, we've got a, a, um, a panel uh, of, uh, of three experts who will be asking questions uh, of, of the speakers. Um, and the, we will then uh, you know, also take a discussion from the chat room at that stage. Um, our first presentation uh, is a combined presentation uh, by Andrew Bull and Marianne Davies from the UCT School of Public Health uh, and uh, from <coughs> also the Western Cape Department of Health. Uh, and both have been integrally involved in putting in place the systems for monitoring the epidemic in the Western Cape and we'll discuss uh, the surveillance of uh, COVID-19 in the Western Cape. So thanks very much to Andrew and uh, Marianne uh, and over to you. Thanks very much. Okay, um, good afternoon everyone on our side and morning to those who are um, joining from elsewhere. Um, there we go. I was just waiting for the presentation to come up. So, so Marianne and I are both public health specialists with the Provincial Department of Health and we're part of a quite a large team of um, uh, public health expertise that have been um, tracking the uh, epidemic and Graham asked us to just give some insight into what capabilities <laughs> there are and what, what is being done. And um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, I will start by just going over the case surveillance and some of the, the, the um, systems and then Marianne will talk more to the um, laboratory um, surveillance and the recent community screening. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the challenge for us with this was that the, um, we, we are well set up in terms of monitoring what happens in the public sector, but the first couple of weeks of this um, epidemic were almost entirely private sector based. And uh, as a provincial department of health, we don't generally receive uh, private sector data. So we had to put in place a mechanism of um, being able to, to bring on board those data. If we can go to the next slide. So the um, case surveillance uh, initially is very, was very much uh, driven by the outbreak response. So. The thinking initially was if the initial cases coming from mostly from travelers could be responded to uh, with a good outbreak response that the uh, uh, transmission uh, locally from those imported cases and community transmission could be held back um, or delayed. And so the emphasis at the beginning was on rapid identification of cases. The private laboratories did send through um, uh, email notifications of new cases or phone them through to the communicable disease control um, component within provincial government. Um, and everybody, because this was a notifiable disease being a, an atypical pneumonia, it was every, all laboratories were reporting from day one to the, um, to the NRCD. Um, who were also informing the province about cases. Um, so we were fortunate that the case definition was largely laboratory driven, and so there were there are there was laboratory evidence um, as a as a hook for knowing about most cases, uh, even though the numbers are quite small to to start with. Um, and our intention, and so far we've been successful in doing this, has been to record every case uh, electronically with all the details about the case, the contacts. Uh, to enable the contact tracing and the outbreak response, and also some descriptive epidemiology around um, around transmission, um, if the quality of the contact data allow for that. Uh, and the the focus is, was really around the response. Um, if I can go to the next slide. Um, so these are the cases as they've uh, evolved over time, um, and you can see the. The initial cases were mostly what on the graph is black, which is the imported cases, mostly from travelers. The light blue is a category that, that we've kind of has come and gone, which is the local transmissions from imported cases. And the red, the red are the, um, the, local, the community transmissions and the yellow are new cases that have come in here where we haven't yet determined the, uh, uh, what type of uh, case it was. 
and increasingly it's going to become irrelevant. So we're kind of getting beyond the stage of needing to, to, to differentiate our community epidemic is now starting and, we, and going forward, most of our cases are going to be community transmission uh, related. Um, if I can go to the next slide. So in the blue line is the increase in cases over time from the Western Cape. And I think many of you will have watched the national presentation where they've talked about the uh, evolution of case numbers uh, nationally and how that has changed after the lockdown. So we have seen a, quite a gradual increase in the, in the last um, uh, week or so, but still a day on day increase. And we're starting to see clusters, uh, community clusters uh, develop. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. <coughs> a big focus at the moment is on trying to geolocate every case so that we can um, uh, direct the community responses. So the initial responses are very much around the individual and the immediate context. The, the responses now are around community surveillance of, the, of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a much bigger area around uh, nodes of community transmission. This is one example of about seven different geographic representations we have of the cases. One of the challenges is that as we lose that direct contact with cases that was present in the early phase where we could uh, determine accurate addresses um, and, we, and we start to get more and more cases with very scanty um, location data, we might find it harder and harder. But at the same time, as we move into that phase, the, the um, uh, utility of um, outbreak response also gets gets less. The next slide. So the, the intention um, within the provincial Department of Health is to try and bring all clinical data that we can together, public and private. So it's on the next, yeah, on the slide. And so we, we've taken the architecture that we've had for the public sector for some time, which is the provincial data center. Um, we're using the clinical viewing platform for both uh, aggregate and individual patient data. The reason being is that it's web-based, can be accessed by clinicians uh, on and off the provincial government platform. Um, and we've had the, the extra data sources that we've had to add, which have not been traditional public sector data sources, are th um, the three biggest private laboratories that you, you can see on the left. Um, private hospital data, so all the private hospital groups are now uh, through mandated reporting, reporting administrative data to the NICD, who've worked very virtuously with us and they are feeding on a daily basis, feeding the data through to us. We're still finding that we are getting more verbal reports of cases than are coming electronically, but we're going to try and, uh, we, we're triangulating every day to try and make sure that the electronic feeds become more and more complete. And there's also the, the uh, notifiable medical conditions data that come either through it's through using any of the NICD notifiable um, conditions uh, portals. And we're still working to try and get insurance data uh, through from the medical insurers, um, as a, also as a triangulation uh, opportunity, not that we expect that to, to be complete. And we haven't yet been able to access any of those data. And the final piece is to try and get mortality data. And this is a, um, a challenge that we've struggled with for some time, be, uh, getting uh, mortality data from, from home affairs. Um, last slide for me. So this is uh, this is accessible to to um, anyone on SPV who requests access. It's a very high level view of of what's um, of what's happening. Um, I've spoken to the um, the case the cases and the geographic distribution. When we started, sub district distribution was relevant. Now it's no longer relevant, and we need to dial that down to something more granular. Um, on the bottom right, you'll see the uh, laboratory data um, and the uh, clinical data. Um, I did have a slide, but I don't think I managed to include it in, on, on the slide deck um, on the calibration of what we're seeing to the clinical data and, and what we're anticipating. But I think I'll just, in the interest of time, I'll leave it there and hand over to Marianne. Okay, great, can everyone hear me? 
Um, okay. I'll just wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Just wait for the presentation view to come up. Um, as Andrew has said, my name is Marianne Davies, and um, I work with Andrew both in the School of Public Health and Family Medicine at UCT and also um, in the Department of Health at the province. I think I'm still seeing Andrew's slide. Marianne, is it projecting? Um, I can see Andrew's slide. I don't know what other people can see. Yeah, same. Okay, sorry, I'm just opening up your talk. Mom's... Andrew's slide is much prettier than mine, so you can leave it there. <laughs> the right one was there, it just didn't get projected. That's, yeah, not in presentation mode. Is it that one, surveillance of SARS-CoV-2? Is that your no, that's it. No. That's that's not Andrew's. That no, not that one. Okay, it will be there now. Just another sec. Oh, Marianne was up there. It says Echo Slides MAD. On the right. Uh, the one on the right the, with the, the grey and blue graph on the top left corner. Right, sorry, we'll be there now. No problem. It's just taking its own sweet time to open up, I'm afraid. We'll be there now. Is that the right one, Marianne? Um, I'm still just seeing your desktop with four, six presentations as thumbnails. It really should not be the case. It's uh, okay. That's the right one, and then just needs to go into presentation mode. Okay, perfect. Apologies, so, please begin. Sure. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, really some of the results of this enormous um, data management and um, public health effort that has been mounted rapidly and continues to evolve. Uh, the top left shows the total number of lab tests over time in the Western Cape, um, separated into private sector in grey and public sector in blue. As Andrew alluded to, we had challenges with getting the private sector data in initially. Um, and so I think the numbers early on uh, from the private sector can probably be discounted, but the story remains the same of a uh, trend towards a decrease in private sector tests and an increase in public sector tests. And if you look at the figure below, where we're just looking at the public sector tests, the blue line shows a massive increase in public sector tests in the last two weeks, particularly um, since the case definition expanded to no longer require contact with a case or a travel history. And then in the last week where we have um, begun community screening and testing, and on the right-hand side, you can see that um, to date, we've screened nearly 13,000 people in the metro, and those who are symptomatic have swabs taken for testing. About 8% of those have been tested, and in rural, uh, much lower numbers screened, and we're also finding a much lower proportion of people with symptoms. But that fits um, because we know that about 80% of cases at the moment are in the metro. Um, so the, the epidemic certainly has its, its epicenter or has started in the Western Cape in the metro, which is what, what we would expect. 
If you look at the orange line on the graph, we're looking at the proportion positive. This is just out of the public sector tests. And you can see that since the case definition expanded and since we moved to community screening and testing, this has dropped slightly down to more in the 4% than in the 5 to 6%. In terms of the community screening and testing, um, this is very closely linked to a uh, program at the moment of isolation and quarantine. And if you move to the next slide, I can talk to this. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in the Western Cape, we are pursuing a strategy of isolating and quarantining people, both who are identified sporadically as cases or who are identified through the community screening and testing activities who are not able to effectively isolate at home. This is quite similar to the model that was used in Wuhan, although probably not nearly as aggressive and is also based on WHO guidelines. And the aim is that this is a very early intervention and is designed to try to slow down the spread of the disease and to delay and flatten our peak. And for those of you who watched Slim Karim's presentation on Sunday with his uh, forest fires, I must say I spent a lot of my day feeling like I need a fire extinguisher. So what we do is if people test positive and when we um, trace them as cases telephonically or do a home visit, we identify that they're not able to isolate effectively. So this is particularly people living in informal settlements or very crowded um, shared households, people who share uh, water, uh, water facilities and ablution facilities. They are then offered isolation to an isolation facility and close contacts who are also unable to um, self-isolate are offered quarantine. They are monitored, the contacts are monitored in the quarantine facility and if they are symptomatic, um, they will then be, uh, stay there as confirmed cases, but obviously anybody who develops severe illness will be moved to a hospital. Um, once we get very large numbers, this is probably no longer feasible, but also probably no longer effective once we have widespread community transmission, but it's a strategy for pushing, put it, trying to put out the small fires that we see as they emerge um, in areas of high vulnerability. But if low case numbers were to continue, or perhaps towards the end of the epidemic, um, after the peak when we have um, flare-ups, then this may be a strategy that we continue to use. You can move to the next slide. Um, so moving to those who are not in the community, but who actually need hospital admission, this is just a quick snapshot of what we've seen in terms of our hospital admissions so far. So nearly 90% of cases have not been admitted. Um, around 9% have gone into a general ward and about 3.5% have been admitted to ICU. We think this is probably um, an overestimate of true ICU need at the moment because uh, people have tended to be quite aggressive about putting people into ICU because of, um, I think, uh, being uncertain about how severe the disease will be. You can see how this has played out over time in the graph on the left-hand side. Um, this is in three-day intervals, so really a fairly steady rise in hospitalizations, you can see a decline in the ICU. The numbers are very small, so I'm not sure what, uh, exactly what that means, but it, mm -hmm. it may um, uh, reflect that people are becoming more familiar with who does and doesn't need ICU. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that um, there is a growing number of public sector admissions overall with a decline in private sector admissions. And then my last slide, um, if we can move to it is just looking at um, whether people are being diagnosed before or after admission to hospital. So um, on the left-hand side of the zero point on that graph, we're looking at people diagnosed after admission and on the right-hand side, people diagnosed before admission. And what you can see is that by far the vast majority of diagnoses are happening on admission, which suggests perhaps that we're under-detecting cases in the community because the first time we know about people is when they are sick enough to be admitted to hospital. Um, generally a few days um, for those diagnosed before admission, generally just a few days, there are some with very long delays. Um, some of those relate to delays in terms of um, test results and some 
to people who were initially quite well and then deteriorated. And then we do have some people, particularly early on, who were diagnosed after admission, and that was before the case definition was expanded to um, allow for testing of people who were not necessarily contacts. And I'll end there just, if you go to the next slide, by thanking, uh, on behalf of both Andrew and I, the uh, contact tracing team in the province. It's a, a huge team of people uh, with many volunteers actually involved in contacting all our cases and their contacts. The Provincial Health Data Center, and Andrew really needs to take credit for this, who uh, in an amazingly quick time put together a data system to be able um, to enable us to actually keep track of what's going on and then health impact assessment. Thanks. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Andrew and Marianne, for that great overview. Um, we're not going to take questions at this stage, but please stay on the line and, and uh, we can certainly take questions from the panel uh, after Juan's presentation. Uh, unfortunately, due to some abusive and offensive comments on the chat room, we've had to disable that, uh, but we will still continue with the, the online uh, discussion um, after Juan's talk with the, the three panel members. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Juan Ambrosioni. Uh, Juan is a, a colleague who I've known through HIV research for a number of years now, uh, and he's kindly agreed to come and share his experiences from uh, the, uh, regarding the clinical issues, the impact on the health services, and, and some personal reflections of managing COVID-19 in Barcelona. Juan is an, an ID specialist who qualified um, at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina, and at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. He's currently an ID specialist in the HIV AIDS unit and the ID service at the hospital clinic IDABAPS in Barcelona in Spain, uh, which is a leading uh, tertiary university hospital and European research institution. Uh, he's been directly involved in the first line care of COVID-19 patients uh, in his institution uh, since the initial cases in Spain and was coordinating one of the specialized COVID units uh, at the hospital clinic. Um, so I think it's going to be a fa fantastic opportunity to hear from him about his clinical experiences as well as the impact uh, and the response of the clinical services in Spain and, and some lessons for us in South Africa. So over to you, Juan. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Graham. Can, can you hear me? Yes, you can, Juan. We can. Okay. Uh, I'm going to share the, the screen. One second. Okay, can you see now the presentation? <laughs> yes. yes, we can, thank you. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank Graham for, for the kind invitation. Uh, as he was explaining, I'm a clinician, so I'm not a health officer, I'm not, I'm not a politician, so I, I cannot give a good advice on the political decisions that led to the terrible situation in Spain, but I will try to share with you our experiences handling what was and still is a very, very hard situation for us. So this is the, the content I will try to follow. First, to give you an overview of, of how is the situation, how was and how is the situation in Spain, and how my hospital and, and my city need to, to adapt to an unexpected situation, and then some brief overview of the pathogenesis and how we manage clinically in these cases, because as you may know, the, the evidence is, is quite bad to, to have uh, well evidence-based decisions. So let's move to the situation in Spain. This is unfortunately the situation now in Spain and as you can see uh, sadly we, we are very very high in the ranking. This is uh, data from the John Hopkins page uh, from yesterday because I was preparing yesterday this, this presentation and currently Spain is unfortunately the second country with the highest number of cases and the third country with the number of deaths. That's from yesterday. Today we have more than 18,000 deaths in the, in the country, which is really a terrible situation. And the most affected area in, in the country was and is Madrid, the community of Madrid. What you, are, what you can see here in this picture is uh, the IFEMA, which is the Madrid Convention Center. Maybe some of you were there because at that place was, was held the uh, DEXME, the European Conference for for infectious diseases in 2018. And it was needed to be transformed into a, some kind of emergency hospital and developed to, to assist 
up to 1,300 COVID patients. I don't know how many finally get uh, there, but it was very quick and I think they did a, a great job, including a intensive care unit for 20 patients. That was in Madrid. Um, in Catalonia, where Barcelona is the capital city of the, of the autonomic region of Catalonia, Catalonia was the second more affected area. As we, we finally, it was not necessary to perform such a big convention center like a, like a hospital, but all the major university hospitals, including mine, were now transformed into what I call a COVID center. And we need to transform several hotels into what I call a medicalized hotel. I don't know if that term exists in English or not, but it means that we need to transform a little bit the facilities of the hotel to to become a, a hospital. So let me, so what is the situation now in Spain? As, as you have seen, we have more than 170,000 confirmed cases and more than 18 deaths uh, so far. But this is just the confirmed cases, our estimations according for, for a long time. Now we are not performing anymore the, the, the confirmation test because it was reserved for the personnel. So the estimations is that we have between 1 million to 7 million people infected already in the community. And there's a lot of people um, doing considerations regarding the level of protection of the community to see when we can decrease the level of isolation. But unfortunately, we don't have any reliable information on how is the level of protection following an lateral infection. So it's difficult to, to have a decision with this information. But probably we can count the people infected already uh, by millions. And let me talk a little bit of my hospital. My hospital in, in Barcelona is at 800 bed tertiary hospital, a very specialized hospital uh, with a very intense activity in research. And we have normally, beyond the period of the, of the COVID uh, pandemics, we have six specialized intensive care units. One is for medicine patients, for another for surgery, another for cardiovascular surgery, the cardiac one, the respiratory one, and the, the patty mostly for liver transplant recipients, and also several semi-critic units. That's normal. And then my unit, I work for, I'm, I'm an ID physician. We have a, a, a unit with 20 beds for hospitalization and a very, very big HIV unit with close to uh, 6,000 patients on active follow-up more than 90% of them taking antiretrovirals. And then during the peak of, of cases that was uh, in the middle of March, we have up to 80 COVID cases requiring uh, hospitalization according seeking medical advice in, in the emergency room, 80 of them requiring hospitalization. So very, very, very quickly, we had no place where to put all these patients. So. The first case in, in Spain was uh, in the 18th of February. And so by the end of February, it was decided that our unit, the infectious diseases unit, was transformed into a COVID unit. Normally we have every kind of infectious diseases patients, central nervous system infections, urinary tract infection, HIV patients. So by the end of February, it was decided that it was uh, dedicated specifically for COVID cases. And then also we did the same with one of the six intensive care units, uh, at the beginning only with six beds. It was by the end of February. Then 10 days later, by the middle of March, it was necessary to, at that point, to have five units, all of them under the control of infectious disease. So I mean, that means approximately 100 patients and two additional ACUs also transformed into COVID units. So, that, that seems very easy to say, but that means that you need to close the unit to put those patients in other places, to decide where you're going to put them, and then to put doctors in charge of patients, and some of them, they, they didn't have any experience treating COVID patients. So it started to be a little bit complicated. But then during the peak, when we have 80 patients requiring hospitalization, then it was necessary to open a new COVID unit or a new improvised COVID unit every one to two days and a new ACU every three days. So by the first week of April, my hospital with 800 beds, it was transformed into 18 COVID units, 13 ICUs, so all the critical ones, all the semi-critical, and then some uh, reanimation areas some places. We tried to get some ventilators and transform that into an ICU. 
Also two medicalized hotels under our supervision with 400 more patients and also what is called the, the, hospital, the domiciliary hospitalization. It was specifically for the personnel of the hospital. Now I am both a doctor and a patient because myself I get infected and I'm now in, in, in um, my home hospitalization and I have the calls every two days to see how I'm going on by my colleagues. But so virtually, it was virtually transformed over one month and a half in almost a monographic COVID hospital because all those patients need to be moved move out, the patients of any other pathology, and it was virtually transformed in a monographic COVID hospital. And that was the situation not only in my hospital, but in all the hospitals, in all the tertiary hospitals in Barcelona and the surrender area. So the problem is who, who was in charge or who is in charge of all these units. At the beginning, when we were only five, it was not so difficult because we are a very big service. So at the, at the beginning, all these units were directly under the control of infectious disease service, but we stopped virtually any other activity. For example, for the, for the 6,000 patient consultation, we decided to, to move it to uh, telephonic consultation or telematic consultation and just to, to uh, allow patients to, uh, to receive medication for three more months because it was impossible to, to handle that. And virtually almost all the doctors in the HIV unit were moved to the, to the COVID units. Only three doctors, the, the head of the unit and two senior doctors remained in the HIV consultation just to give the phone calls to the patients and to renew the prescription. And all the rest of the doctors, including myself, were moved to the COVID units. But then when the units continue to get open, five is okay because we're a big service. But then when we have 18 units, it was impossible to be under uh, our, our supervision. So finally, at the end, currently, almost all the services, pneumology, gastroenterology, hematology, everyone, endocrinology, are now handling COVID patients. And we are acting as uh, giving support as consultants because it's impossible for us to, to be in, in all these units. And it's, I have to say that it's working pretty, pretty okay. And so I would say that now the, the, the sentence would be all against the COVID. That's, that's myself here in the picture, that's me. And that's the, the unit I needed to, to coordinate uh, one of these 18 units I was coordinating until, until the day I, I get ill. But she's a primary care physician. She's still not a resident doctor. She just finished her studies. Uh, she's a rheumatologist. Those guys are vascular surgeons. That, that's an almost retired cardiologist. Uh, she's a dermatologist. She's a still a student. She's working a lot, helping us with the reports and the, and the administrative issues. And so we were in our unit, this 24 unit, we were having every day between six to eight admissions and discharge because we needed to move away all these patients and to, we were receiving permanently patients from the emergency department and so we needed to, those who were stable, we were moving them to the hotels or to the other uh, smaller uh, hospitals. So it was, it was incredibly disgust, uh, terrible to, to work at that level because uh, we were all very tired and we were, of course I was supervising the work of all the, they were really good, though, every one of those, but of course, the session were saying, sorry, but I, I cannot do more of myself because this is clear not my, my, um, my specialty. So but I think at, uh, at one point when the number of cases became so important, everyone was transforming to a COVID doctor and, and finally everyone knows very well how to do it. So let's move now to, to the clinic and um, something that you know and how we need to adapt to this um, number terrible number of cases. I know you're concerned by the, the, the high proportion of HIV infected patients you may have there. Uh, we were also concerned for that because as, as you have seen, we have 6,000 patient, 6, patients in our consultation. And there was a statement said by the European AIDS uh, Clinical Society only a couple of weeks ago, saying something that we, we had the impression all the HIV doctors um, seeing also patients with COVID, that the, not the incidence, neither the, the, the severity of the disease was higher in the HIV positive individuals. Although it is true that we have very uh, limited experience with patients with severe immune suppression. So they also said that it, it should be assumed that patients with low CD4 cells or, or not receiving antiretroviral treatment, they may have a more severe disease. 
we are not very sure about that, but it, it's just a warning. But it's, it's true that we were not seeing more cases or more serious cases in HIV infected population. Um, the truth is that if you take a look into PubMed, there's very few cases or series published. This is a, an article just accepted from our, from our institution. It should be published today online, but I checked just before the presentation, it's still not there. It's a, a short series with our first cases. And I would say that it, it's true. We have not seen any specific pattern and neither more severe cases. And also there was a presentation in another webinar last week from uh, the secretary of the HIV program in Spain, showing some preliminary data from, from Spain, mostly from Madrid. And in fact, it's true that we have more or less the same incidence in the HIV population than in the general population. But it's also, it seems that we have less aggressive or serious cases we don't know what is the reason. Maybe it's because we will see later in the pathogenesis, if you have some immune suppression, maybe you cannot develop the cytokine storm. We don't know. Or more probably what I think is that uh, tenofovir or, or TAF are giving some, some protection because they are chemically very similar to remdesivir and probably that's the reason for some uh, kind of protection against serious presentation in the HIV population. But of course, if you're not taking antiretrovirals, you won't have this protection. And then, um, as you all, all know, the incubation period is approximately five days, the median, and you will have, if you have community transmission, finally you will have a lot of cases, but the majority will be either asymptomatic or very mild disease, as, as myself. Uh, still, probably 1% will have a serious disease and will need mechanical ventilation. So that is not a lot. It's probably less than what you have with, with flu every year. But if you consider that maybe you will have uh, 100,000 confirmed cases that, and, and then you need to ventilate 1% of them, that means 1,000 people into uh, and mechanical ventilation. And if they come all together, you're going to have a big problem. And that was the problem in Spain. Um, and that was the problem also in Madrid because there are, it was an explosion of new cases. It was a little bit more progressive in Barcelona, so we had the time to adapt and open as in my hospital. 13 intensive care units. And then, as it happened in many uh, viral diseases, some part of the clinical manifestation will be the, the direct consequence of the viral replication, but also you will have some indirect um, immunopathogenesis. And you may have seen these this, uh, photographs, sorry, but it's in Spanish because it was adapted from another presentation I, I gave uh, last week. And this is uh, the, the clinical presentation according to the time of evolution. And you have mostly three, three uh, main phases. In the first one, you have a flu-like symptom, a flu-like uh, syndrome with fever and dry cough and very important viral replication. And then after one week, you enter in a, in a clinical phase where replication is going down and immune and cytokine storm uh, can begin that not ha that is not gonna gonna happen in all the patients fortunately only in the minor in the minority and those patients are those who can develop the serious presentation and the serious pneumonia pneumonia later and keep this in mind is extremely important because the therapeutic approach is not going to be the same for a patient seeking medical advice after four or five days of clinical symptoms compared to someone coming two weeks later so we will come to this a little bit later. So what do we have and what is the evidence we have for treating COVID? So if you go to the antivirals, as you know, we have a lot, a lot of publications of drugs that may have some clinical activity or at least that may have some in vitro activity. You also have a lot of immunomodulators that may be active or may be effective uh, during the, the second phase. And you also have some drugs acting a little bit in, in between. You, you have the baracitinib, which is also some uh, activity uh, against the entrance of the virus into the cells. You have interferons, you have also hydroxychloroquine and acetromycin. But unfortunately for all these uh, enormous amount of publications, we have very, very, very bad, very poor, poor or very poor level of information. And in fact, in many cases, we have contradictory, uh, contradictory results, as, as I put here, the classic of the Olympique de Marseille uh, against the Paris Saint-Germain because uh, Didier Raoul was saying that it was a fantastic combination of hydroxychloroquine and acetromycin, uh, getting down the replication in the upper respiratory tract. And then some days later, 
Jean Michel Molina was saying that it was not at all the case in the patients in, in, in Paris. So we have to, to deal with this contradictory information. Moreover, the few well designed clinical trials we have already have yielded negative results, as is the case of the lopinavir ritonavir for severe cases, but used as monotherapy and, and, and late. We don't know what happened earlier and in combination. But fortunately for you, because you are handling uh, very well, as I could see, uh, the number of cases, and you, it seems you have the, the, the situation, at least for the moment, under control, you will have the results of many clinical trials available in, in the coming weeks, so you will have much better level of evidence than what we had. But we were in the terrible situation of an avalanche of patients coming to our hospital, all this information, and we needed to do something as, uh, at the moment of uh, I was preparing this presentation last week. We had more than 1,600 hospitalization in our, in our institution. So we needed to do something because, of course, we had not uh, 1,600 beds in the ICUs. This is, I, I think, it's a very important conclusion of the uh, IDSA guidelines that they were launched only two or three days ago. These are an overview of the seven recommendations they, they can uh, give. But as you can see, in almost in every case, it's written knowledge gap, or in, in one case here, very low uh, certainty of evidence. So it's not much more than what I, I showed in the previous slide. So, but, but it's important because uh, the conclusion is try to include every time you can patients in clinical trials. And it seems that you have the time to include, uh, to, to add uh, clinical trials to your institutions or to develop your own, because you still have the time and you're increasing very, very slow the number of cases. But it was not the situation in my institution, so we need to develop, already we are 12 versions of the local protocol for treatment that was done by the head of infectious diseases and also a senior consultant of the HIV unit, plus all the evaluators and the reviewers, and this is a document that is in permanent revision, and that's what we're doing now with the confirmed or probable cases because we are not performing anymore, not performing anymore the, the, the swab, the test. We are keeping them for the personnel. So we are just working with the clinical presentation. For the patients presenting only with an upper respiratory tract infection or even with a mild pneumonia, eh? pneumonia only with, with unilateral infiltrates or no or minimal level of normalities and not having any comorbidities, we are just uh, giving symptomatic treatment and just sending patients home or, and, and providing follow-up, that's it. Then for those who have a moderate pneumonia, so those no uh, fulfilling the, those characteristics and, and requiring hospitalization, in that case, what we are doing now is still, we still have the medication, we still have some stocks. We're giving triple therapy with lopinavir, ritonavir, hydroxychloroquine, and acetromycin. Why we're giving lopinavir, ritonavir, and, and this medication despite the contradictory results? Because it's what we have, and we think that there are some effect of lopinavir, ritonavir. The negative results were in the serious cases and very late. They started at 13 days, and it was in monotherapy. So we think that maybe we can do something with this triple combination. And we also have a clinical trial from remdesivir. Those who can uh, enter in the trial are also receiving remdesivir. And then for the patients who have a, a severe pneumonia, according to the oxygen requirements or progression in the chest X-ray or, or, or having hemodynamic compromise, particularly if the symptoms are uh, longer uh, than one week or 10 days, we are also given the triplet combination, but we are also prioritizing uh, immunomodulators for those patients, in particular tocilizumab, because it's the one uh, with the highest, I would say, level of evidence published. So let's see some prototypic cases. So I will show you a couple of, of patients I, I, from, from my unit that I have chosen, what I call the prototype patient. So the, the one that is seeking medical advice very early, the infected patient, and the one seeking medical advice very late, what I, what I call the inflamed patients, but the majority in fact are, are in between. So this one, uh, as I was saying, is what I call the infected patient. And it's the one who have the maximum benefit of antiviral treatment because they are very early in the clinical course. So that's a HIV infected patients, very long uh, term uh, clinical uh, course for his HIV infection. He's male, he's in the 30s, 
And he had five days of evolution of fever and dyspnea and some dry cough. He just resumed antiretroviral treatment because he had abandoned it uh, some time ago. And he still had detectable viral load because he resumed it only a couple of months ago. That's uh, his chest X-ray. And as you can see, you have bilateral infiltrates. Of course, with such a severe immune suppression, you have to think about the differential diagnosis. So we performed the, the, the swab, the smear, and he, he was positive for SARS coronavirus 2. And we performed also bronchoalveolar lavage and was negative for PCP. There was a differential diagnosis in that, that kind of patient, despite the fact that it was a very short clinical course. So only five days of, of um, symptoms, and that's the characteristics of uh, his requirements of oxygen. And the, he was not required, in fact, he was with a good basal saturation. He was not lymphopenic. He, he had a mild increase in LDH and also mild increase in inflammatory markers, only the CRP was quite, uh, quite high. So for him, we modified the antiretroviral therapy. He was receiving uh, Sintusa with uh, Darunavir. We changed it to Lopinavir, Ritonavir. We kept the, the TAF and the FTC. And we had also hydroxychloroquine and acetromycin for five days. And we put him in the clinical trial of Remdesivir also for, for five days. And the clinical evolution was really good. He, he presented a very important clinical and also uh, laboratory improvement, and he was discharged very quick after five days. That's what, I, despite the fact he was severely immune suppressed, and that's what I call the early patient, the infected patient. Let's move now to the other kind of patient, the one who's seeking medical advice much later, and what I call the inflamed patient, and the one they think uh, have more benefit of the immunomodulators. So that's a male patient in the 70s. He had fever, dry cough, but he, he started the symptoms 10 days before. And he had at that time a positive uh, swab for SARS coronavirus 2. He started as an outpatient with lopinavir, ritonavir, hydroxychloroquine, and acetromycin. At the beginning, it was OK. But then, as you can see, there's a very important uh, radiographic progression, mostly uh, on the left, but bilateral. And he also started to have dyspnea, and we repeated at that time the, the swab, and at that point it was negative. It doesn't mean we know the sensitivity of the, of the nasopharyngeal swab is not 100%, it may be, it could be 80%, 85%, but it's possible that in that case, after 10 days, the role of the viral replication was marginal for this patient. Anyway, he was, he was still receiving the last day of lopinavir ritonavir. So, that's the situation when he entered the hospital. He was really requiring a lot of oxygen. He was severely uh, lymphopenic, 300 lympho uh, lympho total lymphocytes at that time, and he was really, really inflamed. Uh, 33, sorry, 23 of CRP, very high levels of LDH, ferritin, and dimer. So we started with him with tocilizumab. He presented some improvement in the markers at 24 hours, but not a lot. So we also had later uh, methylprednisolone pulses, three days, and also a specific blocker for uh, EL1, which is an Akinra. And in fact, he improved slowly, but he improved. Uh, the requirement for oxygen were uh, not so important. He improved the lymphopenia and also the inflammatory markers, but not completely. And why? Because he developed one of the complications we're seeing more frequently, which is the organizing pneumonia. We were not seeing that at the beginning, but now with more than 1,600 patients, we're seeing a lot of complications. So what is the real life? Those were prototyp prototypic patients, but probably the, the, the majority of them, when they are admitted to the hospital, they overlap with the viral and inflammation phase. And probably the majority of the patients may benefit from simultaneous use of antivirals and immunomodulators, what I call the real patient. I think the, the majority of them are, are, are some, somewhere in between. But besides, if you're going to uh, start only immunomodulators, I don't think it's a good idea to, to stop antivirals because you don't know if you're going to increase the replication the even steroids, for example. And then we are seeing a lot of toxicities. You know very well all the doctors who, um, who were prescribing some time ago lopinavir ritonavir know very well the diarrhea you may have with, with Calitra and also the sometimes difficult to handle drug-drug interactions, particularly for the elderly. And we were seeing a lot of hepatotoxicity, mostly due to, to tocilizumab. And then 
another important issue, when we have 100, almost 100 patients coming to the emergency room, it seems that everything is COVID, but that's not the case. We still have some other diseases and we still have uh, bacterial superinfection or streptococcus pneumoniae. So you have to keep your mind very open, thinking that you may still have some other uh, pathology. And at the beginning, we were giving uh, antibiotics for everyone, but then we realized that uh, procalcitonin never increased, and then we, we tried to avoid um, the overuse of unnecessary antibiotics. But we are seeing a lot of complications, as the case I, I presented before, organizing pneumonia, also a lot of uh, pulmonary embolism. And then another big issue is that patients are recovering really, really slow. I'm now, now at home, uh, like uh, 12 days and still have asthenia, I still I had fatigue and really recovery is very, very slow. So, so if, you, you have, if we have problems to isolate the patient at home, we also have problems for this change. So th that's an issue because if you have patients continue coming to the hospital, you need to have place for them. So what would be what I learned after these two months, uh, two months in Barcelona and in my hospital of the, of the coronavirus disease? I think it has been the sanitary and logistical challenge, the, the bigger we had never experienced before, in need of permanent adaptation, uh, not also of the logistic in the hospital, but also in the treatments we were offering. I think that the, for the moment, our local guidelines, all the existing guidelines have been prepared with very low levels of evidence for, for all the therapeutic recommendations we are giving. And uh, however, I think we, we have learned that we have to prioritize antiviral treatment in the first days, and however, do not delay too much the immunomodulatory treatment uh, if you see clinical and analytical markers of inflammation, because that will be the only way you can avoid the ARDS and the need for intubation and mechanical ventilation. If, if you have a lot of patients, that is going to be the difference between uh, living or dying. Probably, I think the, the majority of the patients will benefit from both immunomodulatory or, or antivirals, speaking always in the patients that are in the hospital, but if you have time, try to include all the patients in randomized clinical trials because it's the only way to generate good clinical evidence for the recommendations. And then I think you are lucky in that way because it was impossible for us, we, we did not have time, but you will have the result of ongoing clinical trials very shortly. For example, a couple of days ago, it was published the, uh, the preliminary data of remdesivir in the compassionate use, but those data is completely not useful at all because there's not control arm, so you don't know what to consider or what, you, what is the conclusion you can have of this trial, but you will have very short the result of the trial with the randomized clinical trial with remdesivir, so you will have much better level of evidence for your recommendations. And then I would like to conclude with this sentence that, that is uh, taken for the IDSA guidelines saying the fact that uh, they know that it's not possible to include in, in every clinical setting patients in randomized clinical trial, but at least we should try to create some local registers. Because if you do, do not do it, without such evaluation, we often attribute success to drugs and failure to disease. And I think this is really, really something very dangerous. So I think you still may have time in the southern hemisphere, but be quick because winter is coming. Thank you very much for your attention. That's some pictures I have from my colleagues in, uh, in, in Barcelona. I don't have a pictures of, of all of them, but uh, I would like to thank them because we have been doing a really, really hard work. And uh, it doesn't matter what is the specialty or the profession, we are working really hard. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Juan. That was an amazing overview of, of your experience and some really useful lessons in there for us in South Africa and, and information and knowledge that, that we haven't necessarily got through uh, through the, the literature that's coming through, um, those kind of lessons about how you've adapted in the service and some of the clinical uh, knowledge that you've picked up in the service is really useful. So I think we've got about 10 minutes left for um, discussion from, uh, you know, questions from our panel uh, to the speakers. Just to introduce the panel very briefly, um, the panel is, is made up of Mark Mendelssohn, Sipad Lamini and Linda Gal Becker, all uh, in the Infectious Diseases Division at Kuriskian at, at UCT. And I'm going to ask uh, Linda Gale if she wants to ask the first question. Thanks, Graham. Uh, Linda Gale here. Juan, thank you so much. And also to colleagues Andrew and Marianne for, I think, getting us up to date. Really appreciate it. 
Kwan, I'm going to direct a quick question to you. We don't have much time, but I want to just start by thanking you for doing this despite being sick yourself. I, I really appreciate that. Okay. Um, and, you know, and just warm regards to the whole team there in Spain. We send our very best wishes. Thank you for really, I think, giving us an honest appraisal of how you've got to this point. So my question, I, you know, my PhD was on tumor necrosis factor alpha. So I'm absolutely intrigued by the switch of what you're calling the early infected patient and then the late inflamed patient. It's a, it's a great um, description. You, you mentioned time as one factor, but just, and I realize that this may be anecdotal, but are there any other characteristics that you would say would demarcate the patient who's going to go on to this kind of inflamed phenotype? Um, because clearly, we, we, we're not going to be able to get our hands on those immune modulators quite to the same extent, and, uh, but, but intriguing and I think so important to be able to apply those immune modulators to the right patients. So your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you very much. It's a, it's a very good question. And in fact, uh, we are learning on that. So I, I don't have a definite uh, answer for that. At the beginning, we wanted to, to measure the IL-6, but it was impossible because in real, at the beginning with 20 patients per week, it was maybe feasible for the lab. Later with uh, 80 patients per day, it was absolutely impossible. So I think what you, the, the clinical evolution will tell you because uh, the first case I presented, as you will see, the, the, the CRP was going down really, really fast, and he never entered in that inflammatory phase. Then for the patient, when you see that the, the, after some days, uh, CRP still remains uh, high, ferritin still remains high, you have the dead liver that is not going down, I think that is the patient that can benefit from giving some, uh, some blocker of some cytokines before he started to develop the, the respiratory insufficiency, because at that time, I'm not very sure when they are already ventilated that you're gonna be infected. So I, I think it's really important the, the clinical uh, follow-up and particularly the very uh, frequent, we have uh, inflammatory markers in the lab, CRP, ferritin, the, the, the dimmer, you can have the, the level of lymphocytes. When, when the lymphocytes remain low, um, that seems that this patient is gonna develop some, some inflammatory phase. Thanks, Juan. So, uh, Sipo, did you, did you have a question? Uh, hi, thank you. Thank you, Graham, and uh, thank you to, to the speakers. Um, I think mine is just to Andrew Bull, uh, in, with regards to the surveillance system that the Western Cape has, 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 has done. Um, just a question about um, uh, what he thought about uh, the role of community districts in terms of trying to, to put down the fire and, and whether this surveillance may also help uh, facilities in particular communities to actually become sort of COVID centers or transform their health services just geared to, to COVID centers, um, whether that would be something he thinks is, is seen as a role of, 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 of his, um, of the surveillance system. Andrew, did you get that? Um, Sipa, I missed the beginning of the, the um, role of community. Uh, so districts, districts. Districts. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, Marianne might even be a better, better placed than me to answer this, but, but my understanding of the initial thoughts were that the outbreak response was really to try and contain the imported epidemic. And once it became, um, once it became established in the community that it would not be a cost effective intervention anymore. I think, uh, it, the thinking has evolved that the um, this kind of sparks that that Slim Kareem spoke about are, um, are, are those fires or fires that is worth trying to douse, and so the outbreak response is being pushed now very much from a central team to these uh, uh, sub districts, um, and they will probably continue for a while yet, trying to contain new areas of um, of, of established community transfer. Uh, transmission. So there's definitely a, a, a very um, decided role for ongoing outbreak response and more of a community response model than an individual case uh, contact uh, response model. Um, in terms of the um, new non uh, new clinical sites and non-traditional clinical 
um, locations. I'm not the best person to talk to that, but I know there are definitely provincial plans for establishing new capacity in, 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 in what previously have been clinical facilities. Thank, thanks, Andrew. And um, Mark, did you, did you have any questions? Yeah, so thanks very much to, to all the speakers and uh, uh, really a, a question for Juan. Um, I mean, it's, an, it's amazing what you've managed to do you know, as ID specialists in a country that doesn't recognize infectious diseases as a specialty. And I very much hope that one of the, you know, one of the positives that comes out of this is that you are now recognized for what you guys do. Um, I was very interested in your picture of all your colleagues because there was within that group there was quite a difference between sorry about the banging outside quite a difference between uh, people wearing n95 masks and um and uh oh, n95 respirators and and your medical masks i mean can you just tell us a little about a bit about challenges that you've had with personal protective equipment um whether you've had whether you've run out how you've dealt with that and then just the last question around um, whether you are also seeing this very large uh, number of patients with uh, abnormalities of sense of smell and taste. Um, current and latest paper suggesting 60% now with anosmia um, in, in uh, proven patients. So really the PPE and the anosmia at Aguzia. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, I'm, go I'm not going to talk about the infectious disease in Spain because that's that's a shame. Uh, but um, regarding the picture, that was in our common room, I would say. We were wearing masks in, in all the hospital facilities to avoid to get contaminated between between us. But to enter, we had no problems, in at least in my hospital, with the uh, with the equipment for, for protection. There was some unfortunate pictures from, from Madrid, but it was not the case in at least in my in my institution. And we were keeping the the, the personal protection equipment with 1095 for the all the procedures when you can have some uh, kind of aerosolization such as the swab or uh, LBA or any or, or also for the hygiene of the patient for, for the nurses. Um, but then the, the surgical masks were all for the all, all the other facilities where we don't have patients in the in the hospital. And what was the, the second part? Sorry, the second question. Uh, Lots of smell. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, fortunately, it's the only thing I, I'm keeping. <laughs> I, I I lost all my energy, but not my. Uh, I, I don't have anosmia or, or agelsia. So yeah, it's very frequent. I, we don't know the reason. We are working with some neurologists and they think it could be, we, we had some cases also of encephalitis, despite we, we were not able to, to have positive uh, PCR in the cerebrospinal fluid. The neurologists are, are convinced that this is something central, but we don't know really what is the pathogenesis. Uh, what is true is we are seeing this in, in a high proportion of cases, but honestly, I, I don't know what is the, the, the reason and hopefully, and the good thing is the majority are recovering. It, it takes long, but the majority are recovering. Great, thank you, Juan. So I think uh, we're just over the hour and on, and we'll wrap up at this point, just to say to uh, Andrew, Marianne, and Juan, uh, thank you very much for these great presentations. I think they've been very illuminating. To Juan, uh, I hope that your recovery from COVID-19 uh, continues <laughs> and you'll be back, back at work soon. I hope uh, so. The best. Um, and just to say to the, the audience, thanks. We've, we've had a great attendance today, just over 350 people. Um, and we will be sending out the notice of uh, next week's meeting uh, via email uh, for people to register uh, with the program. So thanks to everyone again and uh, catch up with you next week. Bye bye. Thank you very much. See you. <clears throat> so just before everybody leaves, just thank the participants. Unfortunately, we had quite a lot of abusive chat. So going forward, we're going to look at the security either disabling chat completely or allowing the chat just to go to the co-host and not publicly. So unfortunately, we really apologize for that. So let's thank these talks were fantastic and that don't think it spoiled the talk. So thank you very much for everyone. And then the talks will be available on the Department of Medicine's website from Friday. Thanks. Thank you, thank you very much for the invitation, Graham. And, and everyone, it was really nice. Thanks, Juan. See you. Yes. Bye-bye.